God. I provided you today a list of the names of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you go on the internet and you do searches, which I did, um, you will find that these lists vary from 21 to 32 different names of the Spirit. Uh, one of those names is the breath of God. It's found in the book of Job. But it is Elihu or Elihu that uh, uh, says the breath of the Spirit. And of course, he's one of Job's friends that the Lord uh, uh, in, tells him he's wrong on everything he said to Job. And so I'm very leery to use him as an example. But it is the breath of God. It is the Ruach of God. Technically, uh, that is a true name of the Holy Spirit. Then in Isaiah chapter 11, there are like seven different names that many have applied to the Holy Spirit. In context, though, when I read uh, Isaiah 11, I find it is just the Spirit of the Lord, and then his attributes are listed below that, and there are six of those. But nonetheless, we have a list here of 22, I believe, that speak of the names of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about a couple of these, of course, in the message today. But thank the Lord that he did not leave us comfortless. He sent to us another comforter, a divine paraclete, one called alongside to help. Thank God for the comforter. The comforter has come, and we rejoice in it. Thank God, thank God for the comforter that the Lord has provided for us. In the King James Version, 90 times, the word Holy Ghost is used 90 times. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Hebrews 9 and 14, there is the eternal Spirit. And we'll talk in just a moment about that, but the Spirit of God always has been, always will be. Thank God for God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is the eternal Spirit. And then, of course, one that I'd like to emphasize in the next three names, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of promise, and the Holy Spirit of God. I don't want anyone ever to forget that he is not just the Spirit, he is the Holy Spirit, and it's very, very important that we remember that. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit, Hagias Numa, that he is holy, holy, holy. And it's not an it, it's a he, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And this term truly speaks of his purity, speaks of his majesty, and speaks of his Glory. We're thankful to the Lord for the Holy Spirit of God. And let me tell you, friends, when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of your life, He does things that change you completely. Thank God for the holiness of our God. Thank God for the Holy Son, Jesus. And thank God for the Holy Spirit of God. Purity, glory, and majesty are His. And He will change the life of any believer who receives His power. There is, of course, the Spirit, which is the overriding uh, uh, word for the Holy Spirit, uh, not only in uh, the modern Bible, but also in the King James Version, more mentions of the Spirit than any other title. And we find examples of that on this page, the Spirit of Christ. And the question is asked, who gives this thing? Jesus Christ gives this thing. And since Jesus gives it, I want it. He is the Spirit of Christ. Isaiah calls him the spirit of fire and the spirit of burning. Peter calls him the spirit of glory. He is the spirit of God in Genesis 1 and 2 and 1 Corinthians 2, 11. He's also the spirit of the living God in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3. Thank God, the spirit of God and the spirit of the living God. He is the spirit of grace. I will always remember uh, our dear brother uh, that came to our church from Nigeria, and he would always give the message and say, Thus uh, saith the spirit of grace. And that indeed is a title of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of his son in Galatians 4, the spirit of holiness in Romans 1, the spirit of judgment in Isaiah 28, the spirit of life. And as I mentioned before, he is the spirit of the living God. How many of you serve the living God? Hallelujah. Thank God, thank God. He's the Spirit of the Lord in Isaiah 11, 2. There are six attributes that follow in that verse. He's the Spirit of the Lord God that anointed Jesus as prophesied in Isaiah 61 and fulfilled in Luke chapter 4. He is the Spirit of truth. Hallelujah. Thank God for the truth. Jesus said when the Comforter comes, he will guide you, he will lead you into all truth. 
Many times I have been corrected by the Holy Spirit. Is it comfortable? It is not comfortable. But it is necessary. He guides us into all truth and he speaks of Jesus. Hallelujah. And anything that glorifies Jesus, you and I should desire. You and I should want it. It's the spirit of your father in Matthew 10. And he is simply thy spirit in Psalm 143 and 10. Thank God for the names of the Holy Spirit. And again, I reflect on these and I consider that he is holy, that he is of Christ, that he is of God, that he is the truth. And we thank God for the names that reveal a little bit about the nature, the nature of the Holy Spirit. So we begin part one today, the Spirit of the Lord. And I want to speak to you about the Spirit of the Lord and salvation. How many of you saved today? How many of you are born again? Uh, I'm really surprised that not every hand went up. Uh, maybe I need to preach on salvation today. I don't know. Jesus taught us that we are born of water and that we are born of the Spirit. John 3 and 5, that great passage of you must be born again. John 3 and 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Nicodemus, except a man be born of water, that natural birth, and of the Spirit, that supernatural birth, that birth that only God can bring into our lives, the new birth, if we are not born of water and of the Spirit, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again. That which is of the flesh is flesh, but that which is the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Thank God for being born again, saved, hallelujah. Eternal life in heaven is our destiny with Christ. Thank God for the born again experience. I want you to see here that not only the Spirit is involved in our salvation, but the Father. Father God is involved in your salvation. John 6, a no man comes to me except the Father which has sent me, does what? Draws him. The Father draws us to Jesus. And then Jesus, of course, is involved in our salvation. One example is John 12, 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. When you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life, you are saved. You are born again. Thank God for the salvation that comes, and it is a birth, a spiritual birth, a new birth. It is being born again, born from above. Thank God for this new birth experience. I'm glad for that. But did you know that this eternal spirit was also there on the day of creation? Let us, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, get a hold of this with me just a little bit here. He is, he, the Spirit of God, along with the Father, the Son, Jesus, who spoke the worlds into existence, were involved in our creation. We didn't exist without him. And we have shown you here in this first part of this message that the Spirit of God is also involved in our salvation. Well, how many of you glad you were created? Yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, better to be created than to evolve. I'm glad I was created. How many of you glad you're saved? Praise God. That ought to excite everybody in the room. I'm saved. It is the same Father, the same Jesus, the same Spirit of God that is involved in this thing called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Seems like if I like his creation and I like being born again, seems like I would like the other things that he provides to us as well. And the next of these is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Glossolalia. It's called speaking in tongues. It's from the Greek word glossa, which means tongue, and lalia, which means talking. So if you want to simplify it, it's simply called tongue talking. And I know a lot of people will view this and think, boy, those Pentecostals, they sure are weird. That's okay. I'll take that title. Uh, peculiar people we are. I'll, I'll take it. I'll receive it. Uh, they call us a holy roller, and uh, I say thank you. Thank you. Never seen it, but 
Thank you for taking note that there's something different about the Pentecostal believer, the Pentecostal experience. It is glossolalia, this tongue talking, and it happens throughout the Bible, and we could argue many other places where we could mention it, but just these three for this morning. Acts 2, 4, of course, being familiar to us, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together in one place in one accord. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and sat upon each one of them, and they were all filled, all 120 present, all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to what? Speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There's an important phrase there that I'd like for you to reflect on today. Who gives this thing? The Spirit gives this what? Utterance. It's something that happens in the mouth of the believer, in the tongue of the believer. The Spirit of God gives them not a happy smile, not a joyful look, not a zeal or excitement. The Spirit of God gave them utterance. Utterance. James tells us that this thing called the tongue is an unruly member. It sets on fire the course of nature. It's full of iniquity. It's full of evil, this tongue. How many of you wish you hadn't said a few of the things you'd said in your lifetime? But thank God the power of the Holy Spirit is going to take control of your life. Where does he start? The tongue. Thank God, thank God he does. And here in this case, these who were so weak just 50 days earlier, so weak, now we find them bold in the Lord because the Spirit has come upon them and because they have the utterance. Friends, we are not here for an intellectual learning experience. We are here to hear the Word of God, believe what it says, and do what it asks us to do. Thank God Jesus said, tarry and wait in Jerusalem. We'll talk about that in a moment. Until you've been endued with power from on high. They had a 10-day prayer meeting. Don't you wish you could have been there? 10-day prayer meeting. And then all of a sudden on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, these events happened, and they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The next of these is Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 46. Now in Acts chapter 4, the believers were also filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the Word of God with boldness. But if you follow through from Acts 2 to Acts 4, you find that these are the same individuals that had already spoken in other tongues in Acts chapter 2. And thereafter the healing of the lame man, here they are put in prison, and they, they're threatened by the religious leaders, and they come out speaking the Word of God with boldness. It is in Acts chapter 8 that Simon and the sorcerer sees that these by the laying on of hands of the apostles are filled with the Holy Ghost and he offers them money that he too, Simon the sorcerer, could have this ability to give men this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this speaking in other tongues. Well, if it was just a joyful look, any comedian can do that. If it was just a happy experience of some kind, a, a, a joy that just floods your heart, well, that happens many times in, in many ways and all kinds of people, of course. But Simon the sorcerer saw something that he did not have. He found it to be powerful, and he wanted it. Of course, he was cursed by Simon Peter. <laughs> I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Uh, and Simon says, pray for me that none of these things happen to me that you just said are going to happen. Wow. Be careful. It is the Apostle Paul who saved in Acts chapter 9 who later in Corinthians will say, I speak in tongues more than you all. And so we leave those off because they're not specifically verses that say they spake in other tongues. But in Acts chapter 10 upon the house of Cornelius, the Gentiles also are filled with the Holy Ghost in the same way that the Jews were. While Peter yet spake these words, who? The Holy Ghost did what? Fell on all, there's that all again. The same Acts 2 all is also found here in Acts chapter 10 in the house of Cornelius. The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word of God. Let me tell you, friends, the Holy Ghost isn't falling where the word of God is not declared. There are fakes and phonies and frauds, but the Holy Ghost doesn't fall where the true word of God is not preached. I'm just telling you. The Word of God was being spoken, and the Holy Ghost fell on all of them. 
and they of the circumcision, the Jews, which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out. Now, I like that word fell on them in verse 44. But here it says, on the Gentiles also was what? Poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you're already born again, you have the Spirit of God in you. Thank God, thank God, you're born of the Spirit. But now comes this outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the house of Cornelius and all that were present there. The, the, the Holy Ghost was poured out, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and how did they know it? They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Acts chapter 2, they spoke with other tongues and they gave great witness as Simon Peter preaches and 3,000 are saved. Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 10, the Holy Ghost is poured out upon them. They hear them speak in other tongues and magnify God. And then Acts chapter 19 on the Ephesians. The Bible tells us there were 12 of them. They had heard about the baptism of John, but they had not heard about the baptism of Christ and so they were baptized in Christ, and what happens next? When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. If you haven't been water baptized, dear friends, please, please, please be water baptized. It's a work. It's not what saves you. You're already saved. But be baptized in the, Holy, be baptized in the name of Jesus. Be baptized in water. Um, I loved what evangelist Tim Inlow said when he was here. The first thing that they did after these 3,000 and 5,000 got saved, the first thing they did was baptize them. They didn't offer them a new converts class first. They baptized them. And what followed subsequently was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God falls upon them, and such is the case here in Acts 19 in Ephesus. They're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul had laid his hands upon him, what happened? The Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Acts 4, they spoke with boldness. Acts 10, they magnified God. Acts 19, they prophesied. That was what you call a weird day. New converts, not churchy, just new converts, Baptized in the name of Jesus, baptized in the Holy Ghost, and what happens? They start prophesying. Man, I'm telling you, there's power in this thing. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for every believer. All believers are entitled to and should seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How do I get this thing? Just like you get anything from God. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. No one teaches you how to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. No one dare, particularly in this church, no one dare coerce you to speak in other tongues. I've heard some of the strangest things in my life in this area. I'm not your baptizer. Pastor Jonathan is not your baptizer. Jesus is your baptizer. And he, the baptizer, doesn't need my help. It's his work, and he does it. You just open your life to him. Ask him, ask him, ask him. My great-grandmother was filled with the Holy Ghost. She's a Methodist woman working in her garden and she said something to this nature to the Lord in prayer in her garden. See, I thought it had to be in church at the altar at the Sunday night service, but no, it's not, not so. My great-grandmother said, Jesus, how can I praise you more? And she immediately began to speak in an unknown tongue, something she had never heard about, never witnessed. She began to speak in an unknown tongue in her garden. She went back the next Sunday and told her Methodist preacher what had happened to her, and he invited her to leave the church. <laughs> That's okay. Probably wouldn't be Pentecostal up here if she hadn't left the church. And then I was preaching as a young man, not even out of college yet. I was preaching in Edgerton, Ohio. 
and I was preaching at a Catholic church. I'll never forget the night that it was. It was the night that Jim Jones, we heard the first report that Jim Jones and his followers had committed suicide. What an opportunity to preach that day in that church, uh, preach the gospel. And um, so I was staying with this family there, and, and uh, this lady was Catholic, and she was um, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I asked her about her experience, and she said she was listening to Jimmy Swaggart music in the bathtub. And she said something similar to what my great-grandmother had said decades and decades and decades before. She said, Jesus, how can I praise you more? And all of a sudden, she began to speak in other tongues. Not in an Assembly of God church, not at the altar, not on Sunday night, in the bathtub. Oh, my. God can do anything, anywhere. But the recipient, the vessel has to be born again, has to be open, and simply has to ask. No coercion, no teaching how to do it. God knows perfectly well how to do his work without my help. Thank God. Thank God. Well, there's the Holy Spirit and power. Luke 24, 46 through 49, before the day of Pentecost, before Jesus departs, Jesus said, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. So who sends this? I as Jesus. I send. And whose promise is it? It's the promise of the Father. You can help me out here. I, Jesus, send the promise of the Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with dunamis, with power, power from on high. You want to know how to cripple America? Take her power away. We didn't experience so much here, but on the East Coast, they sure got a fill of it. Take the power away. And, uh, of course, I enjoyed listening to Roger and Sissy Olson who uh, decided this winter that they're going to get out of Kansas City because of the winter, and they went down to Texas where they lost the power. Not only did they come back from Texas to Kansas, uh, they decided they're not going to Texas anymore during the winter. So, <laughs> Thank God that the disciples, obedient to Christ, stayed in Jerusalem for that 10-day prayer meeting in an upper room. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost, and they were filled with the power that comes from where? On high. It's the promise of the Father, and it is given by the Son. And again, anything Jesus gives, I want. Acts 1.8 now. <laughs> I think we've been accused in the Assemblies of God and Pentecost of only knowing a couple of verses, and this would be one of them. But you shall receive power, dunamis. After that, they're already born again. We're already born again, but we receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Some of the modern Bibles change that word after. But it is obviously subsequent in all of these events, subsequent to the new birth experience. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Thank God he comes upon us. And the result is, you shall be witnesses unto me, unto Jesus. Do you see the Trinity involved in each one of these? The Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. You're going to be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I have a question for you. Jesus, who was crucified, buried descended into the lower parts of the earth where he led captivity captive, gave gifts to men, and on the third day, he rose from the dead. Could this Jesus, the sovereign Lord, have from the day of his resurrection established his kingdom on the earth? He could have. He's God. But he didn't. The disciples sure wanted him to. 
The, the last question is he's ready to ascend. Is, will you at this time restore the temple? <laughs> will you remove the re oppression of Rome? And Jesus says, before his crucifixion, it is expedient for you. It is necessary for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, whom the Father will send in my name, will not come. This is the plan of God. It's a plan of God prophesied at least from Isaiah. In fact, Joel speaks of it. Isaiah speaks of it. All of these different prophets that speak of this glorious infilling of the Holy Spirit to come. Jesus said it is necessary, it is expedient. Now, there are two things that I find in Scripture why Jesus left the planet. Number one, he's going to prepare a place for you. He said clearly, John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. Bill Gaither wrote a song about I have not seen, earth not heard, and uh, he talks about he created all of this wonderful creation in six short days. And Bill Gaither writes the song saying, just think what he's been up to the last 2,000 years. I go to prepare a place for you. That's why I left. What's the other reason he left? John describes it also as the way I mentioned it just a moment ago. If I do not go away, the comforter whom the Father will send in my name will not come to you. And so there are these two purposes why Jesus left. But I'm telling you, Jesus is going to return. And the work of the Holy Spirit isn't just evident in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. The work of the Holy Ghost is evident throughout the world. No iron curtain can stop it. No communist nation can stop it. No authority, no power can stop it. It's the power of God, and it's available to every believer who would ask, who would simply ask, am I grateful for my salvation? Most of all, I am thankful to God for my salvation. But I am so thankful also for this glorious infilling and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. For there is dunamis power. And if the Father gives it and the Son gives it, then I want it. The Spirit of the Lord, our paraclete, provide four verses to you here. We skipped Acts 4, 31 through 33 about power as they spoke the word with boldness earlier. The Spirit of God and our, who is our paraclete, John 14, 16 through 17, and I will pray who? I, Jesus, will pray the Father, and he, the Father, shall give you another comforter. Purpose, that he, not an it, that he may abide with you forever. Church, he's still with you. Abiding, abiding. The comforter abides with me. Who is he? He's the spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot, say cannot, the world cannot receive. I remember one time an evangelist came to Leota, Kansas, and he was going to lay hands on this old boy to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I just stood by looking and said, I wanted to tell the evangelist, you might want to make sure that man gets saved first. And, of course, nothing happened because the born-again experience precedes always precedes the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you. Thank God, somebody thank God with me today. He dwells with you and shall be, this is prophetically in John 14, shall be in you. 
John 14 and 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, in Jesus' name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I, Jesus, have said unto you, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, time after time after time after time. Who gives this thing? Jesus gives this thing, and it is the gift of his Father. Mm. John 15, 26, but when the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, has come, whom I, Jesus, will send unto you from who the Father? He's the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 16 and 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient, it is necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you. But if I, Jesus, depart, I, Jesus, will send him unto you. Jesus told, told us, church, it is necessary. It is expedient. So when a young lady, I mean a very young lady raised in Catholicism, asked me, as she said, your sermons are so different. They're so different from anything I've ever heard. Why are they so different? No credit to me. That's the work of of the Holy Spirit, touching the life and the heart, the soul, the spirit of that young girl, and quickening life into her for the first time in her life. Thank God for the paraclete, the comforter, the counselor, one called alongside to help. He, the paraclete, is our advocate, our comforter, our companion, our counselor, our friend, our helper, our intercessor, the one who speaks in our defense, just like Jesus does. He comforts us. He convicts us. Thank God for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He directs us. He empowers us. He guides us. He intercedes for us. He leads us. He secures us. It is, after all, the earnest deposit of our inheritance in the saints. He teaches us. And he quickens. He makes us alive. If the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he shall quicken your mortal bodies. Thank God for the work of the Holy Spirit. Advocate, comforter, companion, counselor, friend, helper, and intercessor. He comforts, convicts, directs, empowers, guides, intercedes, leads, secures, teaches. And he quickens. Finally, the Spirit of the Lord and the anointing. Now, there are five more of these coming tonight. The Spirit of the Lord and the anointing. I um, looked up 1 John 2, 20 and 27 in uh, Vine's Expository Dictionary of the Bible. Looked it up in other places, too. But uh, Vines is not a Pentecostal word. I'm just telling you. The slant on Vines Expository Dictionary, though, it's a great resource for Hebrew and Greek words. It is not a Pentecostal dictionary, not by any stretch of the imagination. But I looked it up. And even Vine's Expository Dictionary said that 1 John 7, 20 and 27 is talking about the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. Thompson Chain Reference Bible, I looked it up in the Thompson Chain because I always do. And it's talking about the Spirit indwelling, the Holy Spirit. And every resource that I looked at the Apostle Peter is talking about what the Spirit does in our lives. 1 John 2 and 20. But you have. I like that word have. 
you have, ha have just works for me. I have three grandchildren. I have a beautiful trophy wife. I got a wonderful church family. Amazing church family. Have the word of God. The sword of the the sword of the spirit. Don't don't say you love the word of God and ignore the spirit. It's the sword of the spirit. But I also have an unction, an anointing from the Holy One. And you know what? All things. Why? Because the Spirit teaches all things and brings all things to our remembrance. You've never had a teacher like the Holy Ghost. He testifies of Jesus. Verse 27, but the anointing, same word in the Greek as unction, the anointing which you have received of him, what does this anointing do? It abides in you. And you need not that any man teach you. You don't need me to teach you. The Holy Ghost will teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance and testify of Jesus. But as the same anointing teaches you all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. When we pray the prayer of faith and we anoint with oil in the name of the Lord, what is the oil? The oil is a symbol, just a symbol. There's nothing magical or mysterious or mystic about the oil. It's just a symbol. This oil doesn't heal you. Jesus heals you. But it represents the anointing. We call it anointing oil. Thank God you and I have an unction, an anointing from the Holy One. We don't need men to teach us. Tonight we'll talk a little bit more about that. The anointing of you've received. Wow, let's look at that. 1 John 2, 27. The anointing which you have what? Received. How did you become a Christian? You received Jesus. As many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the sons of God, John 1, 12. As many as believe on his name. That's how you became a Christian, born again. How did you get this unction from the Holy One? How did you get this anointing? You received it. Who gives it? The Father, the Son, gives this gift. And what do we do? This anointing we have received of Him. Holy Spirit.